Youssef, Planner, Trissa Mason, Community Development Manager, Alexa Olam, Administrative Specialist, Kimberly Adem, Administrative Specialist. Thank you also for attending with us tonight. Can I ask a motion for approving the minutes from our last meeting? So moved, Commissioner. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Alexa, can I have a motion to approve our minutes of vote? Roll Commissioner, call. yes. Yes. Commissioner Ingram? Yes. Commissioner Kamak? Yes. Vice Chairman Amador? Yes. Chairman Popio? Yes, the motion has passed. Uh, five yeses, thank you. Mr. Swan, will you please introduce our first case of the evening? Certainly. Good evening, folks. Um, our first case this evening is CU-120-21, Crystal Packaging Incorporated is requesting a conditional use permit and associated development plan approval for operations including existing slash modified tank farm exceeding 48,000 gallon above ground capacity, chemical manufacturing slash blending, storage and processing of hazardous materials, petroleum product manufacturing and an existing slash modified rail spur for the property, which is located at 9155 Boston Street, zone I-3 heavy intensity industrial district. Uh, Stacy Wassinger will be presenting the case for the city this evening. Good evening. Um, Trisha or Alexa, can you let me share my screen, please? Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, Chair, members of the Commission. As stated, this is a conditional use permit request and associated development plan for Crystal Packaging, um, the operator at 9155 Boston Street. Included in this request are a number of um, uses that altogether are part of the operations of Crystal Packaging, but are part of our um, land use table that require conditional uses in the I-3 zone. Um, these include the existing tank farm to the uh, west of the existing building that is currently a little over 2 million gallons in capacity and the request in here is to um, allow an increase of that capacity up to 2.5 million gallons um, and I'll get into the details of that a little bit later um, and then request two, three, and four including chemical manufacturing slash blending storage and processing of hazardous materials and petro petroleum product manufacturing um, are all part of the operations in the building that include um, blending to create essentially cleaning products and, and some of those kinds of products. Um, clarifying that the some of the processes that Crystal Packaging does are not, don't necessarily fall under all of these categories. Um, and that in terms of the storage and processing of hazardous materials, the primary material there is methanol that is stored in such a quantity that it requires a hazardous occupancy um, because it's flammable. So that's that's the main one under that request. So it's not every material that's stored is in such a quantity as to be hazardous. Um, and then request five is there is an existing rail spur to the south that may require or have a um, an expansion. So they're including that as part of this request as well. And then in the, uh, the development plan includes some of the site improvements and um, overall operations of the site that are associated with all of these requests and the operation of Crystal Packaging. So uh, orienting you to the site here a little bit, this is the existing site. It is zoned I-3. It is an, an industrial area um, with I-3 zoning and I-2 zoning surrounding it. The uh, vacant areas to the north are owned by the railroad. Um, and there is uh, another sort of similar type of use. The Burko Corporation is directly to the, the west of this property. And so there is a, um, it's just a generally an industrial developed area here at um, Boston Street is 92nd Avenue that turns into Heinz Way. Um, on the other side of this property to the east, there is the railroad and then um, Highway 2. 
So the future land use category for this um, is general industrial, which fits with that heavy and in, uh, heavy industrial zoning and use and the requested conditional use permit. And so the details of the case history and existing site is that the building and tank farm were developed in Adams County um, prior to annexation into the city. It was zoned I-3 when it was annexed as part of that um, the large annexations that happened north of 88th Avenue in 2008. Um, and at that time, or subsequent to that, there were um, operators in there that would have been non-conforming with some of these um, uses, particularly the tank farm, um, and that uh, the previous tenant to Crystal Packaging was Rocky Mountain Petroleum. Um, Crystal Packaging moved from a site that they had in Denver in 2018, and as part of an asset um, purchase agreement, they actually purchased Rocky Mountain Petroleum operations and continued some of those um, when they move into the building. But as part of the moving into the building, they were required to make or had to make some uh, exterior improvements to the site um, and due to that kind of fell into the uh, the category of requiring conditional use permit um, because the non-conforming use section in our land development code doesn't really cover expansions or a lot of um, improvements to the site and things like that. So that's the purpose of this application in part. Um, the company was established in 1977 it started with some um, blending for like airline chemicals and things like that and has moved into also co commercial and consumer products. Um, part of this facility, the emphasis of this facility would be on organic and er environmentally friendly cleaning product production. Um, so kind of bringing that into this part of Commerce City. So here's just a current site aerial photog uh, photography of, of the um, existing structure and tank farm. As you can see the building kind of shields the tank or is in front of the tank farm from view from highway two, including also the property to the east. Um, so as part of this, and we'll, I'll show you the development plan in a minute too, that there is a um, inclusion of, of the area to the north of the building as sort of an outdoor storage area and then um, some additional fencing and landscaping that would bring those improvements to the site to help with vis visual mitigation of the tank farm and things like that. So here's the part of the landscape plan and development plan um, showing that there would be a, an opaque fence or a screen fence um, that is proposed in this area and then along the north part of the site and to the to be flush with the building down here to the east and that is where that outdoor storage area is proposed. Um, this fencing is meant to help also um, shield a little bit of the tank farm from view as you're driving along 90, 92nd Avenue to Heinz Way. So helping uh, mitigate the visual impact of that area. And then um, here's the other half of that, just showing some of the increased landscape improvements along Boston Street, and then that existing rail spur to the south of the south side of the site. So with this um, conditional use permit and development plan, there were no additional public improvements re required in the area. Um, like I mentioned, they're proposing to add additional landscaping um, and screening to the site, and then um, specifically screening that outdoor storage and on the northwest corner of the site. So the DRT analysis found that based on the applicant's request that the um, CUP and development plan requests meet the approval criteria in the land development code, um, the proposed CUP is suitable for the site and the area is an established business that's moving into an established industrial area. Um, and brought the number of employees up to in that um, location up to about 40. Um, it allows for the use of an already developed site and that already developed tank farm for this new use and that the proposed site improvements add to the um, mitigation and compliance of the site. So going a little deeper into that, saying uh, generally speaking, the industrial areas is, is suited to the site operations and um, 
all of the existing infrastructure and improvements in the area support that use. Uh, regarding request one is the tank farm, um, that this would allow the utilization of that existing tank farm and then allowing the increased capacity there, the proposal is that they would replace tanks on a one, one for one basis, just the tanks would be a little bit larger um, for each site or for if, if they were replacing those as they go along. Um, and as part of that, there is an, a, uh, an emergency response plan and they have secondary containment and all of the things that would be necessary for that expanded capacity, um, working directly with fire department and state regulators as well. Um, the, in addition to that fencing, we, um, staff has proposed a part of a condition that would have any replacement tanks being painted um, beige or tan so that they are reducing that visual impact as well. For requests two through four, these are the, the blending um, using petroleum as part of the blending and the hazardous materials. To clarify again, the hazardous materials is primarily methanol. Um, as far as the petroleum goes, it's used only in blending. There's no refinement of petroleum or anything like that. It's part of the blending operation. Um, so it just is, falls into that category in the land development use table. Um, these activities uh, incur indoors, so they're not, other than the part that's related to the tank farm, so they're not creating a um, nuisance or, or anything like that for the uh, industrial area. And then request five is the rail spur, which again is, is suited to this area because there's already existing rail line um, and it is not creating a, a large impact on the industrial area that, that is proposed to go into. Regarding the development plan that associated with the CUP, um, that together the, that development plan kind of puts those um, those site improvements, such as landscaping and the, the fencing, it, it shows those improvements. So it's helping to um, meet the criteria of the development plan, um, as well as the, the CUP request in, in conjunction with each other. So here are the three proposed conditions that staff is recommending. Um, the first condition is that those site improvements be um, completed from the development plan within 12 months of approval of the CUP. So that includes in, in the, the landscaping and the fencing. Um, condition B is that they can replace those um, tanks within the fence, but subject to the um, total capacity of no more than 2.5 million gallons and that all new replaced tanks be beige or tan in color. And then C is simply that the, any changes to the emergency response plan, which were submitted with the application, um, be provided to the city's police department no longer than 90 days after a change is made. Um, not for, that condition is not meant to talk about review, but it's so we have those on file so that those can be incorporated if there was an incident or anything that needed to be responded to at the, at the site. So these are the CUP approval criteria, um, essentially that this, these requests um, that fall under the umbrella of this, the conditional use permit meet these criteria that they are not creating substantial or undue adverse effects on adjacent property. Um, that there is mitigation to the extent possible. The characteristic of the site are suitable for the use. The proposed use will be adequately served by um, existing facilities. And the applicant has provided adequate assurance of maintenance. And there's no evidence to suggest that the use violates any state, federal, or local requirements. Um, and then addition, additionally, that there's a community need or the use complies with the comprehensive plan. and. Um, both of those criteria are actually met. Uh, regarding the development plan approval criteria, um, the proposed also meets these criteria in that it complies with city standards, is consistent with the, the zoning, um, provides adequate mitigation, and creates a positive precedent for, precedent for cumulative development in the area. Uh, all the required public notification was met. Um, no written comment was was received for this item. And so with that, the DRT recommendation was that the Planning Commission recommend approval with conditions to the City Council of both the conditional use permit requests and the development plan request. Um, 
With that, staff will conclude our presentation or available to answer any questions. Um, the applicant is also present to speak on behalf of the request and answer any questions the commission may have. Thanks, uh, Ms. Fassinger. Do we, a uh, couple questions for you. What was the thought process of allowing up to the 2.5 million gallons versus I think their current site's about 2.1? Right. Um, so they have, as they replace tanks, it would allow that increase in capacity. There's approximately 62 tanks there and they range in size from about 5,000 gallons to 108,000 gallons. Um, the 108,000 gallons is the, the cap that would be allowed with their, for any individual tank with their emergency response planning containment area. Um, so this would allow some of those smaller tanks to be replaced with larger tanks to increase that capacity and allow them to grow in place. So it's probably really driven off their secondary containment that they have to have. They probably couldn't grow any further than, than that. Yeah. Okay. Since the site has been operational since 1980, do we know of any issues of any spills or any, any safety issues today? There have not been any that were, um, shown in their emergency response plan or any, anything that we are aware of. Okay. Questions from the commissioners? Uh, yeah, I've got a, one question. Um, I know that they have to file the emergency response plan, you know, within 90 days of the change, but do you know if the, you know, fire department reviewed their on-site fire mitigation equipment and it's, you know, going to be satisfactory for the increase in capacity? Um, they, fire, they do work with directly with the fire department on this, and part of the, um, the, the exterior changes that they had to do were actually done at the direction of the fire department. So those, any changes to that emergency response plan would also be in conjunction with the fire department. Okay. okay. <clears throat> she asked? Do you have a question? Yeah. Has South Adams County Fire Department seen the plan and do they have they approved the plan? Uh, that's one of my questions. Um, and then uh, a secondary question is out of the 2.5 million gallons, uh, how much of that is hazardous material or and or flammable material? Um, they South Adams County was part of our review process with this, so they have seen all of these documents, including um, part of the application did include the emergency response plan. Um, and the, the methanol, I believe, and the applicant can also, um, also be able to weigh in on this. I believe it is one tank in the tank farm that's at an 11,000-gallon tank that it contains the methanol, and that's the only currently hazardous material on the site. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Commissioner, or, or uh, Stacy, I have a, a question. Uh, in the uh, proposed motion, uh, we're suggesting to them that we would approve this and then have them, uh, you know, fulfill all of the conditions in, within 12 months, things like um, landscaping and, and uh, the new construction of tanks. What process does the city have to check in 11 months, 12 months, and 13 months that in fact, these kinds of things actually have been done and that they have met the requirements of this. So um, any construction permits would come through, um, they come to planning as well as building. So we would see those as they're coming through. Um, and then it's really would be part of the um, planning follow up on, on the conditional use to ensure all the conditions are met. Good question. Well, do we have a do we have a system for that, or what? You know, but I mean, if they don't do it, who follows up? It would be planning, and essentially, if they if they weren't to fulfill the conditions, um, the community development department would have to bring the a revocation for it, essentially. So it wouldn't automatically um, be revoked, but if they're not meeting the conditions, then the conditional use permit could be revoked through the Planning Commission City Council process. Mr. Amador, did you have a question? Yeah, so in regards to um, request five, the existing modified slash rail spur, uh, I, th I find this fascinating here that we're tying the conditional use permit to 
and we're calling it the existing rail spur would become conforming with this CUP. Um, and it says with the expansion of the rail spur in the area to the southwest of the building. So is the rail spur um, on the site? I guess I didn't see that. So the rail spur is on the south edge of the site and they uh, essentially um, were talking to the BNSF regarding use of that if they needed to have an expansion over into this area. So that is the, if there were to be an expansion, they would have two, um, two and I believe it's on page, maybe page two of the development plan. Um, I can get the packet page for you here. Yes, it's, it's a large plan. Um, so I just wanted to be sure that um, when we talk about expansion uh, for later where that's at. Right. So it is, um, the details of that wouldn't, haven't been, um, it, it, there are not exact details of what the expansion would look like, but it is, would be part of, they've shown the area here on, it is page 27 of the packet. And show that there, if they were to have a double rail spur expansion, it would be to the um, west side of the existing location. And that was my question. So right there, what you just highlighted, that would be the expansion. Say for instance, they needed I don't know, the drop rail cars or something like that, that part of the expansion area. That's correct. more my question. Yes, correct. It would be in that area. Okay, no further comments. Thank you, commissioners. I believe the applicant is, is present, Ms. Fassinger. Can we um, bring yeah. them forward? I see someone has their hand raised. I'm assuming that's the applicant, Connor. Hey, folks. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, um, I'm actually not the applicant. Well, sir, we're looking for the, the applicant right now. So there'll be some public comment later. Uh, Connor Gilman, is, he is working with the applicant. Is there construction? Okay. Uh, and I think he'd be able to answer some questions as well as um, Hank Jenkins is the is a representative for oh okay for Crystal Packaging. Okay, sorry about that. Are you folks able to hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry, no, I um, I'm not sure if I was unmuted or not earlier, but uh, just simply responding to confirm the understanding that I, I believe somebody had chimed in earlier about the introduction. Maybe it was Stacy. Uh, the introduction of the hazardous material, and that's correct. Uh, currently, the hundred. You went dead. Yeah. It would, what was that? I think we lost him. Is, is he? In, Hank is on the phone as well from from that from the applicant. Uh, I can't hear you, Hank. Sorry about that, folks. Are you able to hear me now? I'm sorry. I oh, yes. We can hear you now. That. It, it apparently dropped me off and then relinked me in. Um, no, I'm sorry. I was just mentioning that the 108,000 gallon vessel that is the one that was mentioned earlier for the um, introduction of the H1 hazardous material of methanol. Mm -hmm. That's the only newly introduced hazardous material that's come in uh, to the um, uh, to the prior tenant, which was Rocky Mountain Petroleum, which was petroleum-based lubricants. Um, so it's the H1 material of, of the methanol that's the newly introduced uh, hazardous substance. And Hank, when do you anticipate the talks about replacing the tanks? What's your time frame for, for doing that? And how old are those tanks out there? And what do you see as that process? Good question. Or Connor, either one. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if Hank is able to chime in or not. I know that they're on the call, but I don't know if they've <laughs> I don't know if they've got, if they've got the mute button worked out. But 
Um, no, the the uh, the swap out of the tanks is basically, you know, in terms of an anticipated dates. I couldn't tell you exactly the scheduled PM maintenance on that. Um, typically, tanks of this size are swapped out five to ten year cycles, depending on engineering tests, ping tests, um, structural integrity tests, and a, a a few other matters that are required, you know, for for what these operations are. Um, but as they come due and as the overall integrity of the tank um, becomes compromised, that's where we're looking at, you know, by example, a, a 5,000 gallon tank being swapped to a 10,000 gallon tank or a 20,000 being swapped to a 50,000 gallon um, on these matters. Okay. Yeah, and if I, uh, can folks hear me now? Yes, we can. There you are. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, you know, we are monitoring the, the, the tanks um, all the time in terms of um, uh, uh, their, their uh, uh, health, if you will. But uh, um, really, one of the uh, reasons we were interested uh, to just swap out a tank so that we could gain some extra capacity. Um, uh, you know, we wouldn't, uh, it would be the same footprint of a tank, but we would just make it a little bit taller. And... Um, uh, we certainly appreciate um, uh, being uh, uh, having Stacy helping us out with that, uh, just because we didn't um, want to necessarily have to go through a, a CUP every time um, you know one of the tanks needed some maintenance or an upgrade. Can you guys hear me at all? Oh, yes, I can. Yeah, we can now. All right, thanks, kids. I pro I apologize. I had a hard time getting in. Hank, thank you for sending me that link again. For some yes. reason, it worked on yours. Hello. And, and this is a Scott, doing great. <laughs> this is Scott Vincent, uh, the owner of Crystal Packaging. Speaking. Okay. And any, you know, Hank or Connor, any any safety issues or any spills that we should we should know about that's that's happened out on the site. I can answer that. No. And what what type of chemicals? I mean the the. The packet's pretty general about what's being mixed and created at this location. Can you give a little bit more specificity on what's getting mixed together and what's it creating? You know what, if, if I can answer that, you guys, well, we, we do a wide array of products. Um, we do everything from mixing lubricants, so basically mixing oil for Chevron that, that you put in your cars every day to mixing propylene glycol and wing de-icing fluid that goes to the airport. And we also, um, inside the building and outside the building, but inside the building on our packaging side, we do a lot of windshield washer solvent and a lot of consumer household cleaning products, both on the organic um, cleaning side, which we have a um, organic certification, and we do a lot of environmentally friendly products at the same time. Okay. <clears throat> Questions from the commissioners for the applicant? Just curious, is there uh, protection in, in case uh, a leak happened with a tank? W what kind of uh, protection from uh, groundwater and, uh, you know, seepage into the soil is there or is there any? While we have the entire outside of the property around the tank farm is um, contained and diked, which contains more than 110% of the actual capacity of the entire tank farm outside. And then when trucks come into the facility, if there was, and they will get loaded or unloaded outside of that containment, there are there is a trench that flows into the containment area. So if there was, you know, some kind of a leak outside of that containment area, it will flow into the containment area and it will not hit the uh, storm sewer before it goes in. And we have the ability to shut the storm sewer completely off in case we ever had a problem. Okay. Further questions from the commissioners? Thank you, Hank, Connor, and it says Hank on the screen again, but I'm just typing, you got your name, sir. <laughs> Scott, thank you, all. appreciate it. <laughs> what is the plan for fire, or is there one? Plans for what, excuse me? Fire. 
a fire on the property, a fire in the building, uh, uh, you know. Um, sure. Well, the entire building in, on the inside is sprinklered. Um, the entire outside of the building has access for fire um, trucks to come all the way around. So if there were, you know, any kind of a, an issue, we could address it. Plus, we have a spill containment plan and we have an emergency response plan. So if I understand your, your spill containment plan, this is, is it a burn uh, around the outside? That is correct, sir. Got it. There's, there's, steel, there's a steel reinforced concrete containment and then a secondary with a, with a, with a berm. Container. Oh, so it isn't just dirt. Oh, no. No, no. There is a, there's, a concrete, there's a concrete barrier uh, within the inner, the inner containment of the tanks, and then there's, a, uh, there's also an additional uh, uh, sand berms or, or aggregate berms at various points. Okay, gotcha. Stacy, in the pictures that we sent, did it show um, any pictures of the tank farm? I can't remember. Yeah, it's the third, it was, or fourth, third or fourth slide in from what she was showing earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw a picture in there. Yeah. Okay. Further questions from the commissioners to the applicant? Thank you, guys. Uh, now I'd like to open it up for public comment. Um, it looks like we have two people registered to speak tonight. I uh, would like to, to remind the, uh, the public to please state your name and address, please. And then we are asking to limit comments to three minutes. So I think the first one that we have on the list is Christy Douglas. Can we please bring her, unmute her? Good evening. Hi, my name is Christy Douglas. I reside at 10970 Union Parkway, and that's in Commerce City. Um, I'm not, I wasn't prepared to speak specifically on the last presentation. Um, I do want to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight, though. And I also want to thank you for uh, serving on this board. I know that um, it is a big commitment, and um, there are a lot of really hard decisions to make about what becomes comes before you. Um, so I come to you tonight to ask you to recognize just how important the duties are here. Uh, your recommendations are critical because you are advising on the decisions that decide the future of our city. We're really at a pivotal point right now. Um, we can continue to be what everybody expects out of us, or we could take a different direction and become the exceptional city that no one anticipated. I saw the last meeting and my takeaway was that the members of this board really need to be educated on the possible impacts of oil and gas development, um, especially the negative effects it can have on the health uh, Ms. Douglas, Ms. Douglas, I mean, we're really here to speak about t this case. Oh, okay. Uh, are, you, are you? Do you have any inf any information or any comment on, on this case that was just presented? Yeah, yeah I sure do. Actually, <laughs> I am really taken back about um, what's being asked of <laughs> of us to take on as a, as a city. I can't believe um, the. Uh, the toxins that are going to be on site there and what they're mixing. And to me, it sounded really like they're really not prepared for any kind of an emergency situation. I saw the uh, aerial view of the tanks. They look really close together. Um, so I don't know with the, everything else that we've taken on the industrial, I, I just think that, uh, um, we really need to look at this and okay. that's what I'd say. All right. Thank you, Ms. Douglas, for your, for you your comment. The next person that we have to, that would like to talk is Ms. Uh, Rona Sanchez. Can we please unmute her? Ms. There Sanchez, no, can we please? There, there are no, there are no other, um, 
other comments? Community members have joined. Oh, okay. So she didn't join tonight. Okay. Uh, I will now close the, the record for public comment. Um, we received no e-comments tonight. Wait. Um, excuse me. This is Steve, uh, alternate member Steve Douglas. Um, I had signed it to speak. Let me check. Did, did, I don't have him on my list. Mr. Douglas. Yeah. I got Steve, yeah. Steve did sign up. Um, it's confusing because it's just one name on here rather than both of them signing up together. So they might just be speaking under Christie's name. Okay. Mr. Douglas, and if you wanted to state your, your name and address, sure. the same protocols, please direct any questions to me and we can give you the floor here for three minutes. Sure. Steve Douglas, a former city council member, um, address 101970 10, Unity Parkway, Palmer City. Uh, Long-term resident since 2004. Uh, my question is uh, the, the rail spur. I see that on the look on the Google Maps and you can see there's already a spur. I mean, there's already a rail line. I mean, a spur there. Is this a spur that will continue onto the site like to the back of it? Because right now it's on the side of the facility. Uh, the other question is, those tanks are really close. And then looking at the agenda, uh, Crystal Packaging uh, actually came to the site in 2018. This is a site that was annexed uh, into, the and into the city in 2008. But I'm kind of unclear if this applicant's been there since 2018 or 2008. Okay. Any and, and, and yes, I'm sorry. sorry. Also, going from 2.1 million gallons to 2.5 million gallons is a good size of uh, uh, adages, uh, additional tanks. And would they, what's the life of the tanks currently uh, since they are the new owner? And when it comes to oil and gas or any kind of facilities and chemicals, they are responsible for any, any prior leaks and any present leaks and what are they going to do to mitigate and to monitor uh, those tanks right now in the facility. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Thanks. I think so those questions. Answer your question, yeah, I think we'd asked the applicant earlier about, you know, the tank replacement. They say typically it, they, they last about 10 years, but there are protocols for inspections and those type of things. Um, in place, I think in regards to the rail spur, Ms. Fassinger, I believe that again, that, that is for a future, you know, to tie into the, the line that's just south of the property. Um, I believe Commissioner Amador had asked about that as well. Is there anything sorry, further correct. that we there asked they, on? Sorry, go ahead. Just to clarify, there's an existing rail spur to the south side of the site yeah. that they use, utilize, and then there would be potential expansion to the east side of, of their property, or sorry, west. Yeah, to just so expand really their existing spur on the south side. Great. Thank you to the public for, the, for their comments. Is there anybody else, uh, Alexa, that we had missed? I read those were the ones that were on my list. Uh, <laughs> Chairman Papial, I don't think we answered the question if they were um, in, so in Commerce City in 2018, but maybe 10 years, was that they were because they were annexed in or they moved from Denver after the site was annexed into Commerce City? Can I answer? Good question, question Can I, I can uh, answer that question. The, the original site was developed in 1983 in Adams County. Um, this tenant wasn't there though. Um, it was annexed in as the, the building and the tank farm were already there was annexed in, but this particular tenant moved in in 2018. Thank you for the Yeah, I think the applicant wanted to maybe address that too. I saw his hand raised. Connor, did you 
Did you yeah. have further elaboration just, on that? Yeah, that? That's spot on what Stacy just mentioned. I just wanted to clarify that point that that's correct. The tenant, uh, Crystal Packaging is the tenant user as of 2018. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Amador. Yeah, I missed that one. Okay, we will move on now. Like I said, uh, we will close now the public comment session. Um, we did not receive any e-comments. Um, is there a motion for the case? From the Mr. Commissioner, I move that the Planning Commission enter a finding that subject to certain conditions, the five conditional use permit requests for the property at 9155 Boston Street contained in case CU 120-21 meet the criteria of the land development code and based upon such findings, recommend that the city council approve the conditional use permit subject to the following conditions. The associated development plan dated 11-12 of 2019, including new construction of tanks, fencing and landscaping shall be approved as part of this conditional use permit. The applicant shall install all proposed site improvements associated with the conditional use permit within 12 months of the approval of this CUP these improvements include, but are not limited to, new construction of tanks, fencing, landscaping as identified in the approved development plan dated 11, 12 of 19. Tanks within the existing fenced tank farm area shall be repaired or replaced without revision to this conditional use permit subject to the following. In no case shall the total storage tank capacity on the property exceed 2.5 million gallons all new or replaced storage tanks shall be colored, beige, or tan. And finally, the any changes to the emergency response plan shall be provided to the city's police department no later than 90 days after change is made. Second for the case. I have a question. We need a motion and a second, Mr. Yost, and no. then we can have discussion. No, I'm not going to give a second. I'm sorry. I'll second. Thank you. We're going to have discussion for the commissioners. Yeah, I have a discussion. Um, okay, so we're increasing the capacity from 2.1 to 2.5. Do we know how much of that 2.5 or that additional 0.4 capacity? is going to be either A, hazardous material, or B, flammable material. Well, I think, Mr. Yost, we probably should ask that of the applicant, you know, when we had that session open. Gotcha. Um, we would just be speculating at this point. I would say the, the containment still has to meet. There are certain regulations that you have to meet to, to have a certain containment of its size, right? Those are regulations of how much containment you could have. Uh, Ms. Wessinger would probably know the details of that, of how size your berm is and how it's built. There's very, there's details that usually the state specifies on that, Mr. Yost. Okay, so there's, there's state guidelines on, what you're telling me is that there's state guidelines on how much hazardous or flammable material they can store. And the containment at it, yeah. Okay. Does anyone know what that is? Ms. Waskinger, I don't think I know the, the specifics of, of that unless you do. Along with the berm, if you're asking what size of the berm needs to be, Mr. Yost, I know, I don't. Uh, there, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Stacey. I was gonna say, per, um, per the state regulation or their their application materials, they show that it's really the, um, the containment area is partially um, regarding the largest possible tank, the 108,000 gallon tank. Okay. And so it is adequate for that and then for the, the additional tanks in the area, the, um, that, that has been, what they have on site is adequate for the expanded area or the, the potential expansion. Gotcha. But, okay. Um, I don't know if I want to propose an amendment or not. Um, and, and consider, too, uh, Commissioner Yost, that 
you know, this has gone through several agencies and it's a uh, heavy industrial area that uh, this is not uncommon to have uh, mm -hmm. things like this. And so long as they follow the regulations, like that's, you know, that's what those safety regulations are for. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that we can outthink the um, uh, state and the, and the uh, protocol that, that uh, the planning de department has gone through. No, I, I, I'm, I agree with that. Um, my only concern is that we're giving them free, free license to add another 0.4 million gallons. Um, and we don't know, and we have the state to regulate what that 0.4 million gallons is going to be. Um, but I guess just my concern is what's going to go in, what, what, what is going to go in that extra storage. Yeah. Mr. Timms, it looks like you had wanted to provide some. Yeah, so just to clarify, so obviously if they upgrade their tanks in size, they have to pull building permits, which get reviewed by building and fire. And so the contents, if they were to do a flammable or a hazardous material, those would be regulated by the building code and the fire code. Uh, okay. And so those are gonna those codes are gonna dictate the size and yeah. the operations and where they can go and the setbacks, et cetera. So there are safeguards in place depending on what the contents or the gallon capacity would be of the materials associated with that uh, building permit and fire permit review, if that makes sense. Thanks you, Mr. Timms. I appreciate that answer. Yeah. Vice Chairman Amador, did you have some further discussion? Just more for conversation than anything. Um, you know, the heavy industrial use sites are far and in between in trying to find a site that is available, whether that's Commerce City, Adams County, or Denver, or anything else. Um, you know, in regards to looking at the storage of all of the different, uh, I'm gonna call them liquids at this time, whether they're hazardous, flammable, or whatnot, I'm going to err on the side of state guidelines because I think that's the appropriate thing to do. Um, the railroad spur is the one that really intrigues me. It is on uh, their property. So um, I think the request is reasonable and there are a lot of uh, state guidelines or not even state guidelines, federal guidelines, I would imagine with the Federal Railroad Administration to try to get that done. Um, so there's a whole nother level of conversation with the ask of this conditional use permit. Um, you know, I'm, I don't think it's unreasonable for a business to ask for additional capacity um, if it is a use by right. And that's where I kind of look to uh, Steve Timms right here, use by right because of the I-3 zone district. For the for the for the base use, for the storage tanks in general and base use, yes. So so storage tanks are allowed in any industrial zone district up to a certain volume capacity, and because they have more than that, they need a conditional use permit. So so on some level, yes, any industrial property in the city is allowed to have a a certain volume or gallon capacity of uh, storage tanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, even the building code allows you that as well for not. Um, being over a certain limit of hazardous material, if you want to call it that, before it throws in more safeguards. So um, at least for me, this request is reasonable with the conditions that are um, here. So I will be voting for this. I would agree. And the protections that are in place, like Mr. Tim's, you know, mentioned, you know, there's going to be some other safeguards, you know, to address some of the concerns that you had, you know, Commissioner Yost and Commissioner Amador. We have a motion. We have a second. I second. Um, if there's no, <laughs> so you had the second. But thanks, Mr. Yes. Um, there's no further discussion. Can uh, Alexa? Can you please call a uh, call for a vote? Commissioner Yes. Yes. Commissioner Ingram. Yes. Commissioner Kamak. Yes. Vice Chairman Amador. Yes. And Chairman Popio. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the motion has passed. Uh, five yeses, zero noes. Uh, again, 
Thank you, Ms. Bassinger. Thank you to the app again, and, and thank you to the public for their comment as well. So, uh, Mr. Swan, can you please introduce our second case of the evening? Sure thing, Chairman. Our second case this evening is case number Z-774-04-21. Second Creek Holdings LLC is requesting the approval of the PUD zone document amendment Second Creek Farm PUD Zone Document First Amendment to modify allowed uses and planning area boundaries and other development standards for the property bounded generally by East 96th Avenue to the north, Tower Road to the east, East 88th Avenue to the south, and Telluride Street to the west, zoned PUD Planned Unit Development District. And we will have Dominic Martinelli presenting this case for the city. Mr. Martinelli. Thank you, Mr. Swan. And thank you to the members of the Planning Commission, long time no see. I'll be giving this presentation tonight for Z774-04-21. Go ahead and share my screen here. Um, just need a confirmation from you all that you all can see the presentation. Yes. Okay. So the location, we'll, we'll get into this here in a second. Um, so it's a bounded approximately by East 96th Avenue to the north, Tower Road to the east, East 88th Avenue to the south, and the Telluride Street alignment to the west. Um, so the request tonight is a PUD zone document amendment. It's currently zoned PUD. Um, the future land use plan for this site calls out a number of uses, including residential medium, commercial mixed use, and office. Um, the process, so tonight will be Planning Commission for recommendation and then City Council for approval. There's some additional approvals that will apply to um, the residential filing number three, which we'll talk about a little bit more in depth in the presentation. So the vicinity map, you'll see the Second Creek Farms property um, delineated by the blue line. So it goes south from 96th Avenue all the way to the Second Creek floodplain, west of Tower Road and um, east of the Telluride Street alignment. So directly adjacent, you have Buffalo Highlands filings through four, which are currently under construction, um, Prairie Farms to the north, um, the Legato development to the east. And, and then to the south, you have the DIATC filing, um, the industrial developments, um, the Tower landfills to the southeast. And then there's in the northeast corner of the site, is part of a larger regional commercial center um, that encompasses um, a number of developments. So Ariel, um, you can see, and we'll get into this in a little bit more in depth further on in the presentation. Um, you can see that there is some construction going on currently and is underway. Um, filing one is, you can see the infrastructure and some of the initial grading work being done. Um, that was approved under the original PUD, and this amendment doesn't necessarily apply to this residential filing. Um, but you can see um, the Second Creek floodplain, some of the adjacent development encroaching, um, and then some of the existing legacy oil and gas infrastructure that exists kind of, you can see it's like a scar that runs down the, um, the middle of the property, kind of over the left a little bit. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about that further on in the presentation. So there is some history with this property. Um, it was annexed into Commerce City in 2004. At that time, it was zoned PUD. Um, filing one was approved in 2005, um, which allowed for the development of 333 residential lots. Filing two was approved in 2006 uh, to allow 600 residential lots. Um, so what happened between 2006 and 2019? Um, the economic crisis hit, and the 933 lots that were previously platted um, did not have any sort of development activity um, and remained in place for some time. Um, and in 2019, the city purchased 210 lots in filing one, utilizing the DIA noise mitigation funds. We discussed this a little bit in depth in the, um, the presentation, but ultimately what happened is there was a settlement agreement um, between five different um, Adams County's jurisdictions regarding noise violations that occurred at the airport. Um, the city was granted $1.8 million to acquire and to potentially mitigate um, instances of residential development within noise contours. And the city may ultimately decided to move forward to purchase 210 lots south of 88th Avenue that were previously platted. Um, so within that, that, that kind of rolls into this PUD change a little bit as well. Um, in 2019, 
um, an amendment to filing one was approved for 172 lots and essentially removed all of those lots south of 88th Avenue and dedicated them to the city. Um, and then filing two was approved in 2020 for 240 lots. Um, the area that we discussed in filing one that was acquired by the city is designated to be open space um, in perpetuity in the future. So there are a number of applications that are currently under review by the city for the Second Creek Farms development. Um, so there's, there's three filings that are being processed. Um, filing ones and, or sorry, filing one, filing two have been approved. Filing three is currently under review um, for the subdivision, the PUD permit. And then of course, tonight we're discussing the PUD zone document amendment. And then there is an additional proposed amendment to filing one for the park school site so this would be the second amendment where it essentially splits the 20 acre park school site into um, two 10 acre sites. Um, the south one will be conveyed to um, school district 27J and National Heritage Academies for the development of a, um, um, a private school. And then the north site will eventually become a, um, a city owned park site. So we discussed this a little bit more in, in previously, but the noise mitigation funds, um, we purchased all the residential lots um, south of 88th Avenue. Um, the funds were awarded by a judge to Commerce City and four other Adams County municipalities. And the city acquired lots in Second Creek's Farms filing one after council's appropriation of the funds for this purpose. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the comprehensive plan as it applies. So this is the 2010 comprehensive plan. Um, so you'll see the majority of the core area of the development is designated as medium density residential. Um, the Tower Road alignment um, incorporates um, commercial or future commercial uses as well as mixed use, which is the corridor and commercial uses. Um, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about what types of uses are proposed in alignment with that. And then of course, in the 2010 comprehensive plan, um, the park school site was designated here as shown in blue. And then as I mentioned, the, um, the giant C is the area that was designated as a regional commercial center, which incorporates areas within Second Creek Farms, Legato, um, and then the two developments up to the north. So the comprehensive plan goals, what the, the city's comprehensive plan calls out for this specific area. Um, it is technically within the Northern Range planning area. It's right on the boundary between that and the E-470 influence area. That's the west of Tower Road. Um, where that's incorporated. So the, the essentially the goals for this, this planning are planning for additional commercial development to serve neighborhoods, providing community focus areas, developing a multimodal connected transportation system, expanding the network of open spaces along creeks and planning for park schools and other infrastructure within neighborhoods to support growth. Um, and then we'll walk through this a little bit more in depth um, and the uh, PUD zone document was also included within your packet. Um, the first sheet covers the um, the project intent and shows the general vicinity map. Um, sheet two shows existing conditions. Um, sheet three is the overall land use plan. So this shows the types of uses that are proposed with each area and which uses are allowed in which. Um, sheet four is a land use table. So that, that essentially specifies which specific uses are allowed on each land use area. Um, sheet five has a number of development standards that apply to the proposed uses. Um, Sheet six includes some detail elevations for park layouts and fencing. Um, there's some landscaping specifications in sheet seven. Uh, sheet eight includes right-of-way sections. And then sheets nine and 10 include residential lot and commercial slash mixed use lot typicals and some minor design standards. Um, so to make this uh, a little bit more clear for you all tonight to understand what the intent of the PUD zone document amendment is, um, we provided just an overall summary of the major changes that are occurring within this PUD from what's previously been approved and what's being proposed. Uh, so the first one is, and this has to do with the, uh, the, the noise mitigation funds and the lots that were required. Um, there was an existing residential unit cap of 1,129 units that could occur in the development overall. Um, this proposed value has been reduced to 923, which is the exact amount of lots that are proposed in filings one, two, and three combined. Um, so as we discussed, there are some modifications to the land use plan, and we'll get into that in a little bit more depth. Um, but there have been some changes to the planning area boundaries, sizes, and locations. Um, the biggest change overall um, to, to further comply with the intent of the acquisition of lots south of 88th Avenue 
Um, the original planning area A, um, south of 88th Avenue, allowed for um, mixed use multifamily south of 88th, directly adjacent to the landfill and within the noise contour. Um, this has been removed and um, commercial uses are proposed um, south of 88th in that portion. We'll get into that a little bit more in depth. Um, there is the addition of additional neighborhood commercial area in K1 and L1, and then the addition of a, an, another multi-family uh, planning area, and then a reduction in the park school site. Um, there have been some modifications to, there was a previous limitation on single family attached and multifamily development in certain planning areas in the development. Um, that has been shifted around, um, but ultimately the amount of commercial that was previously in the development um, was retained. And, and this was shuffled based on some of how the land use areas changed. Um, the land use table to put it relatively succinctly was modernized. Um, there were a number of proposed existing uses within the land use table that um, were sort of outdated and don't really um, align with where our existing land use table is today. So if you go into article five, um, the proposed land uses are generally similar aligned and have similar or have the same definitions as what you would find in the land development code tables. Um, additionally, part of this request was a reduction to um, the minimum lot size for some of the residential lots in filing three. Um, there are a number of lots within that filing that um, have a 41 foot lot width um, when the PUD previously allowed for 50 feet. Um, and there's some additional bulk standards that apply to mixed use planning areas. And then there was an increase in the minimum setback from active oil and gas sites from 200 feet to 300 feet. And then the addition of a 50 foot setback from plugged and abandoned well heads. And that, that's generally a summary of the overall major changes. Um, and then the applicant, once uh, it's their turn to give their presentation, can talk a little, uh, about some additional nuances. Um, so this table shows the overall changes in land use. Um, as specifically called out, one, one area that I want to highlight. So the retail commercial slash office designation was originally 27 acres. In the original PUD, this has been increased to 72 acres. Um, the mixed use slash multifamily designation um, decreased to 48.4 acres. Um, public use has decreased a little bit. Um, there was an increase in the amount of right of way. And then you can see the biggest change is open space increases by about um, roughly 50 acres in size. Um, so there are some major changes that are occurring in terms of the overall um, configuration of land uses and what's proposed. Um, so just to kind of highlight and to provide a little bit more uh, clarification with an exhibit. Um, so this is the proposed land use exhibit and I'll flip back and forth between these a little bit so you can see, um, but you'll see planning area, area A um, is now commercial and office only, uh, providing a buffer between the landfill and making sure that there isn't a conflict with the noise contours. Um, open space is planning area C, which was previously homes. Um, and just to provide some context, you'll see the north arrow is facing right. Um, throughout this document, we, we shifted everything um, clockwise 90 degrees to make it fit a little bit easier. Um, so to see that north is to the right. Um, the single family detached area in filing one is planning area D. Um, the public use area um, H is the combined park school site. And then you'll see areas F, K, L, N, and O are a combination of mixed use, multifamily, and commercial along Tower Road, um, meeting the intent of the mixed use designation. Um, there has also been the addition in between areas K and L, our planning areas K1 and L1, which are intended to be sort of a gateway to the development um, that allows for um, mixed use or commercial mixed use, um, bottom floor ground retail, and then um, apartments on top up to 90 feet in height, um, and sort of serving as that central entry point into the site. Um, there is the allowance of an additional mixed use multifamily area um, in planning area O to kind of provide additional layer and buffer between the single family detached and the commercial areas. And then as consistent with the previous development, um, areas I, M, and J are generally um, single family um, detached residential development. And then kind of looking at how that's changed. So there's, there's some shifting in A, mixed use, which did allow for multifamily. Um, some of those sizes have changed and just slight modifications to how everything's laid out. 
So a brief kind of overview of the proposed land uses. So the commercial along Tower Road consists of 60, 66 acres, which generally includes restaurant shops, financial services, medical, dental, veterinary offices, childcare, theater, auto-oriented uses, and another other general commercial um, uses. Uh, the commercial along East 92nd Avenue, which is the gateway development that we talked about, um, permits high density residential as part of a vertical mixed use development with ground floor retail uh, with a height maximum of 90 feet. Um, the rest of the mixed use along Tower Road um, contains similar uses to the commercial, um, but does allow for multifamily or the high density multi-story attached residential townhomes, vertical or horizontal mixed use developments and public and civic uses and allows duplex development, but no more than 50% of any individual planning area. And then there's an exclusion on auto or auto-oriented uses such as drive-throughs, repair shops, and gas stations, and the mixed-use designations. Um, the single-family detached residential, which consists of 187 acres, um, is generally intended to be around four to eight dwelling units per acre. Um, and then the neighborhood park school site is a 20-acre site. And then there's an additional 23 acres of open space in the Second Creek floodplain, as well as the Graham Gulch drainage way, which runs um, in between filings one and filing three. So employment, there's a number of office, commercial and retail mixed uses along Tower Road within 72 acres of that being commercial and 48 acres being in mixed use. Um, so this map uh, does provide a lot of information um, but we wanted to kind of highlight just the overall circulation network in the development. So one of the, the development opportunities that arose um, from that existing pipeline easement that was formerly owned by Anadarko was once that was um, essentially removed according to COGCC standards, that became a, um, a central kind of north-south uh, pedestrian corridor through the development. And the way that the applicant has laid out the public parks in filings two, three, and filing one, um, they all align on that central pathway that goes north to south. Um, so that's intended to be a, um, a 12 foot um, multi-use path. Um, there is a crossing over Grandma Gulch into filing one. Um, and then there are a number of um, on-street bike lanes that are proposed on the collectors within the development. And then there is a east-west um, trail corridor that goes within filing one that leads into the park school site. And then generally the main arterials that serve the site are East 96th Avenue and Tower Road, which are already in place. Um, as part of this development, the, the bend that goes from 88th Avenue into Telluride Street was platted. Um, so Telluride coming through Blylands will, will border this development and sort of act as a minor collector and then curve into 88th Avenue and then ultimately funnel into what would be a future interchange on E470 uh, past the little gallery development. Um, so just to kind of that, highlight that last um, point that I made, this just shows the general transportation plan um, for the surrounding vicinity. So you'll see that um, 88th Avenue has a future interchange and then kind of the overall alignment of major collectors, minor arterials, um, and most of the traffic for this development will funnel east to the freeway. Um, infrastructure, um, so stormwater, Grandma Gulch ultimately feeds into Second Creek and most of the flows from filing one and filing three do fall into Grandma Gulch. Um, filing two has a separate drainage portion which flows north and there as part of the amendment to filing two that was conducted previously allowed for the incorporation of an additional detention pond to capture those flows. Um, so you've, you may have heard some discussion on the T88 diversion project, which was constructed along with Tower Road, um, redirects flows from the north towards Grandma Gulch. Um, and our understanding is the applicant has reimbursed the city um, for the T88 funds. It applies specifically to the 27 acre commercial property in the northeast corner of the site. Um, so water and sewer, um, there is existing water and sewer connections that will serve the development. Um, the applicant has obtained um, water rights for this development. Um, the site also did include within the Northern Infrastructure General Inclusion Improvement District in 2019. Um, so that's a request that's approved by um, the GID board, which is council acting as a separate authority. And that request was approved in 2019. And there are four Metro districts that are 
um, existing for this development. And there are no amendments that are proposed as part of these, uh, these changes in this request that you're all reviewing tonight. And then we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the historic oil and gas development that's occurred here in Second Creek Farms. Um, so there have been four wells that have been in operation. And then there was an Anadarko pipeline that served the, the three on the left. Um, they have been uh, plugged and abandoned according to COGCC standards. Um, so they've all um, gone through the form six process of uh, the interim permit and then the, uh, the final approval after the, the reclamation and the, the plug and amendment has occurred. Um, the Anadarko pipeline easement has been removed as well. There is one current well that is still in place and that's the extraction box elder 4121. Um, it is our understanding that the applicant and extraction of oil and gas have come to a, um, a plug and abandonment agreement, a private agreement between the two entities. Um, a, for, or a request with the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission has not been approved for the plug and manner of that well, but it is anticipated that this well, um, the one highlighted in orange, will be plugged and abandoned in the near future. Um, and then just a, a summary and overview of the public facilities. Um, so the existing 20 acre park school site, 10 acres is designated for the Capstone Academy, um, and then 10 acres for the neighborhood park. And then there are four private parks that are proposed throughout the filings and the overall development meets the minimum park space standard for private parks of 3% of the overall developable land. And then just to highlight um, the PUD approval criteria um, in your overall decision, um, the recommendation tonight, um, this PUD does comply with the comprehensive plan as highlighted. It's consistent with previous concept schematics and um, consistent with the overall intent of the um, initial PUD. It addresses a unique situation by allowing greater density of uses, higher density and taller structures that could be achieved without any straight zone districts. It complies with all standards that are otherwise waived. It's integrated with the adjacent development occurring at Buffalo Islands and Legato. It mitigates adverse impacts on adjacent properties. It sufficiently um, addresses public safety, transportation, utilities. Um, the phasing proposed is rational and the development could not be achieved by other means such as height exceptions, variances or minor modifications. And then the overall recommendation from the development review team is that the planning commission recommend this to um, city council for approval with no conditions for case Z77404021. And then next steps regarding this. So as we mentioned, filings one and two um, are previously approved. Um, once this PUD zone document is amend amendment is approved by city council, um, the applicant would be able to obtain approval of filing three for their subdivision and PUD permit. And with that, city staff and the applicant are available to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Dominic. Dominic, since I know you're, you know, you're very well in tune with the oil and gas I reviewed at, you know, our last meeting. I mean, how does this document, what is the order of precedence here from, you know, that amendment? Because it seems like some of the setbacks might have some differing verbiage. Yeah, so one of the things that we do want to mention currently as it is on the books today within the land development code, there is not a reverse setback. So um, you, as you all know, we've discussed in, in um, mid-January that um, oil and gas LDC updates are going to city council for consideration on the 11th. Within that is um, ultimately you made the recommendation um, for a tiered setback of 300 feet, 400 feet, and 500 feet, depending on the utility size. Um, ultimately, when the filing two amendment was approved back in um, early 2020, um, these sort of um, reverse setbacks weren't in place. Um, ultimately, the reverse setback, if adopted by city council, would apply to new residential construction. So this would essentially be a non-conforming situation um, that's grandfathered in. Um, I believe the okay. last measurement I took, um, and, and ultimately it's a moot point given that this uh, box elder well will be plug and abandon um, relatively near in the future here. It significantly impedes the, the developer's ability to develop multifamily residential or commercial development on that property. Um, but I think it was 247 feet from the nearest residential lot to the wellhead on that site. Um, but ultimately that well will be plugged and abandoned. So that, that's kind of how that plays. It's a little bit of um, a timing situation in terms of when we had amendments coming up 
and when um, the subdivision request was processed. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, because like you said, that, that was such a recent case, and obviously this one's brought upon us, so that's yes. good to have that, that clarification. What discussions did you have with kind of the rebalancing of the residential versus the commercial? I mean, what was the city's, did the city have quite a bit of input on that? Was that mainly presented from the applicant? How, how did that process go, kind of reformatting, restructuring? The... So I, I think a lot of it came in, we'll have the applicant tonight to kind of follow up on some of the, the comments that I'm making as well. Um, but it had to do kind of the main driver of this was uh, making sure the PUD amendment was aligned with filing one in the, the lot acquisition that was occurring. And just kind of looking at um, the existing constraints, looking at how development has sort of occurred over time. And, and given that this, at the time that we were looking at this, this was a 13, 14 year old document, um, what sort of updates could be made? How are we seeing development patterns and trends occurring? Um, what is what is like retail development looking like at this point in time? Um, so trying to shift those uses more appropriately and, and um, some of the feedback was provided by the developer and, and certainly the city did have um, a major focus in these conversations on preserving commercial and making sure that um, the amount of and availability of commercially developable land um, was not decreased during this process uh, to make sure there's a mixed balance of land uses in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Questions from the commissioners for Dominic? Dominic, looks like we have the applicant. Looks like Scott Vincent. Let's see, I think it should be David Foster, Mick Kittle, and Chris Shandor. Okay, if we, we can could. go ahead and promote those. Bring the applicant forward. To say a few words. Hmm. <laughs> Before I bring them forward, Vice Chairman Amador, you had your hand up. Yes, I did. I was uh, going to commend uh, Mr. Martinelli there. He's been pretty busy doing things uh, for the city in terms of uh, oil and gas and this really large overhaul of this PUD. Um, I think I was really interested in the commercial development piece of that, and, and I think you hit the nail on the head with not reducing the size of acreage for commercial development, because um, that's something that I believe the city needs at this point. But I'm going to just listen to more commentary here from uh, David Foster and folks here in a minute. Thank you, Mr. Amador. Sorry, Mr. Hand raised there. I didn't see that one. I do, I do have a quick question for Dominic. Um, on the, uh, the school, when you were first talking about it, you said private. Uh, is it going to be a private school or a charter school or a public school through 27J? I apologize. That, that shouldn't have been private school. It's um, a charter school. A charter school. Okay. Yes. And have they determined a, um, uh, an organization to do that, or is that just, you know, in the, uh, in the planning stage at this point? So there's, a, there's an organization called National Heritage Academies, um, right. that 27J is planning to convey the land to, um, and they are they were the applicant on that um, development plan and subdivision application. Good, good plan. That, uh, the other thing is, you know, there's been um, numerous conversations for years about the plan to connect Tower Road to Buckley. Uh, I presume that takes off of Tower North of this area, or where exactly is that road uh, planned to go or is, have we uh, abandoned that plan or, you know, what's the status of that? Are you referencing uh, the High Plains Parkway? I think that's correct. Let me go ahead and see. So yeah, Tower Road is, is going to, that's gonna be much farther north. So that's gonna be north of 104th Avenue. No, okay, um, all right. So that, that, so that's, that's, that's way farther up. Gotcha, okay, thanks. Yep. Mr. Yost, did you have a question too for Dominic? Or? No. <clears throat> sure, come back and answer my question. Or ask okay. question. Thank you. Dennis for answering his question. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Is it Mr. Foster? Is that who we're 
is presenting. Or yes, sir. Can you hear me okay, Mr. Chairman? Yes. All right. Well, thanks uh, for allowing us to uh, be here tonight, or at least allow me to sit at my house here tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, appreciate, uh, as, uh, as uh, Chairman uh, Amador mentioned, um, uh, Mr. Martinelli has been um, really uh, an unbelievable uh, uh, staff member, um, has worked incredibly hard for a very, very long time. Uh, I understand he's retiring uh, after this particular <laughs> hearing. Um, but uh, in, in all candor, I'm here also with Chris Shandor and Mick Kittle, uh, both the engineer and the, the uh, planner for this site. Um, I actually uh, was involved with the annexation of this site back in 2004 and, and the uh, initial PUD. So uh, I haven't really gone too far myself. Uh, and we weren't doing it via Zoom, uh, rest assured. I'm not even sure there was internet when we were uh, entitling this site. Um, Dominic has identified... Um, Dominic. Hang on. That's all right. That's all right. It's not a good Zoom until you hear somebody's dog. Um, Dominic uh, is right. I mean, the, the, the big reason that we're here has uh, everything to do with... Um, the purchase um, uh, of the land uh, as it relates to the DIA noise contour. Uh, but for that particular issue, uh, we probably would have um, gone ahead and uh, fully you know, platted the, the balance of the site and we'd be moving forward. The, the reality is, is that gave us an opportunity to rethink the site, uh, gave us an opportunity to rethink the site, particularly in, um, in considering the Tower Road improvements that many of us uh, on this um, Zoom tonight were really involved with. And I think it's a reflection of the fact that the Tower Road project that we all invested uh, heavily in is really starting to come to fruition. And it gave us an opportunity to put uh, more emphasis in non-residential use uh, along Tower Road increase the commercial opportunities along Tower Road, the industrial, the office. Um, and so we're real excited by those opportunities as I'm sure um, the city is as well. The, um, uh, the open space uh, that is now uh, integrated into the site, again, uh, you know, it's not often that I get to show up to a hearing where we've increased open space, we've increased um, you know, commercial uh, and office, reduced uh, residential, uh, and, um, you know, I get to, you know, kind of be kind of excited about that um, because I think that's uh, much in line with where the community is. Uh, to the point that was asked just a minute ago, National Heritage Academy is also the developer um, uh, of the landmark um, uh, school uh, over across the street and they are a great partner with 27J and it is a public school. I know that we sometimes get in the middle of conversations, you know, is a charter public, is it private? It's a public school. It's uh, through 27J and they're really excited. They wanted to get open, you know, even quicker than, um, you know, then the plans could even uh, enable us to get open. So, but they'll be open um, and accommodating kids in 27J um, starting uh, the fall of 2022. Um, I really think that um, Dominic nailed it all. If you have specific questions, uh, engineering or uh, land planning related, happy to answer them. But again, uh, quite a presentation by Dominic tonight. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Yeah, I mean, it's the same question I asked Dominic. I mean, what type of market analysis or did you do when, you know, balancing the commercial to the residential? What was that thought process? Again, I think it's just, you know, um, Joel Farkas, who is the owner and developer of this site, who I've had the great fortune of representing for about 25 years. Um, you know, a lot of these guys do it kind of, they, they have a gut. Uh, instinct as to what is going to work and then, um, you know, kind of make their investments accordingly. And that's what happened here. I mean, I think he's just um, uh, making a bet 
that the opportunities along Tower Road are going to be present. I don't want anybody to leave tonight thinking that tomorrow we're, we're going to land a, a huge retail office um, user. Obviously, the market is very, very much in flux right now. But it will provide us the opportunity uh, to work with your staff. And, and your you know, economic development staff uh, is terrific and always sending you know, potential users uh, to all of the different developers around uh, town. So we'll have a great site um, that will be available to any of those users who, you know, continue to, to ring mm -hmm. the, the bell. Mr. Foster, what has been the conversation? Is it the Anadarko well of, of it getting plugged from a timeline standpoint? Yeah, I, I, sooner rather than later. Um, uh, I, in fact, to tell you the truth, I thought it was already plugged and abandoned. So um, I, I think that happens uh, relatively soon. Uh, the other three are plugged and abandoned. Um, and of course, we'll, um, you know, we'll, we will meet the 50 foot setback that uh, has been a part of uh, all of the conversations. Okay. David, I, I'm curious, what kind of uh, interaction have you had with the uh, economic development folks? And uh, I presume that they've been working on some things that may fit in that. Uh, any uh, positive uh, directions with uh, econ folks? Uh, well, good evening, Commissioner. Uh, I, I will tell you that they were really helpful uh, as we were uh, kind of going through the initial planning uh, for the site uh, to make sure that we had the appropriate amount of acreage available. Um, you know, I haven't had any recent conversations, um, you know, about uh, potential users. Uh, those are going to be confidential anyhow, as you know. Um, but uh, you know, we think that it's designed and in a location to really attract, um, you know, some some great users. You know, we're just the next site north of DIA Tech, so um, you know, it's uh, it's coming. One of the, one of the things I'm getting, uh, you know, good users in uh, your your medium tech and higher tech, uh, you know, whether it's a, a phone room or a uh, uh, assembly. Uh, group is uh, having the opportunity to put uh, fiber uh, into those uh, locations. And I know that we put a uh, conduit so that we could do it, but what's the, you know, that's a, that's an expensive infrastructure thing. What uh, has, has any thought been put into that to provide fiber to possible tenants up and down that stretch? Well, that's a really good question. I don't know if Chris or Mick have a, uh, an answer on the fiber. I, I will tell you, um, as they're coming on, I will tell you that um, there was a lot of infrastructure in Tower Road that got um, put in after a lot of negotiation uh, you know, with the contractor and as we were developing that site to make sure that um, you know, the, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, um, uh, conduit underneath um, Tower Road. So, but I don't know if it looks like Chris maybe came off mute. Chris, did you have an answer? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that we've had preliminary discussions with some of the dry utility companies. I mean, until we really understand the end users, it's it's hard to know exactly where that infrastructure is going to go, but it sounds like it's available if we do need it. So. Okay. Any further questions from the commissioners for the applicant? Thank you, Mr. Foster. Great, thank you. Uh, now we're gonna open up for the public to, to provide comments to, to the case. I believe the first one we have is uh, Ms. Douglas, Ms. Christy Douglas, can we please, can you please state your name and address again one more time, Ms. Douglas? Um, Christy Douglas, 10970 Unity Parkway and um, I am thrilled that there's going to be development there, especially commercial. However, I really have concerns about grandfathering in rules that apply to oil and gas. Um, new rules have been legislated and there's um, um, something that's in place, Senate Bill 181 
that requires moving forward that the health, safety, and welfare of uh, residents comes first. And going backwards and grandfathering, and I hate to pro prohibit any development, um, but we've really got to consider that human health and safety has to come into the equation and it has to come first and it has to it has to be considered before any kind of profit is considered so i would take a deeper dive into that um uh, i really don't want to see um more cluster homes i don't know if that's in in part of the plans but the cluster homes that, that Oakwood has put in have virtually destroyed um, the reunion area. So I really don't wanna see any of that. And the other thing I'm concerned about is National Heritage Academies. That is actually a for-profit organization. Um, they externalize their costs so that they don't have to have, they don't have to have a cafeteria, they don't have to have transportation, um, they don't have to abide by the rules that are the standards that govern teachers. And so um, they're, uh, what I have experienced is, is that they can hire anybody for a lesser salary than the professional teacher uh, gets or anticipates and I've heard of parents being hired as teachers at, for very low wages and that really bothers me it was started by a billionaire it was started in Michigan and they have a real reputation for destroying the public school t system so that's, that's my other real big concern. Um, but as I said, I'm thrilled that there's going to be development there. And, um, but I just want to see it done the right way. So I appreciate the time. Thank you, Ms. Douglas. And I, I think just to provide a clarification there, I mean, the approval of this is not, you know, we're not approving the, the charter school. That would be through, you know, the school district, you know, itself, not, not through this board. Um, oh, so some of those comments might be, you know, through them. I just want you to know that that's a concern. I want the developer to know that that's a concern. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm assuming we still have Mr. Douglas too, as well. Steve is. Yes. State your name and address again, please. Yeah, Steve Douglas, uh, former city council member, uh, 10970 Unity Parkway. And I forgot to state uh, last time that um, also uh, happy, um, Okay, thank you. Uh, anyway, so I want to get into to this right here, and, and I, I wish I could uh, ask a question I want to ask, but uh, um, and um, good to see you, David Foster. My question is I have is, you know, the city purchased 210 lots in filing one to utilize the DIA noise, noise mitigation, and those funds were used, those, those funds from the, from the DIA mitigation were used to purchase this prop 210 acres. And so if you look at the residential lots, it should, re it should reduce the residential lots from 333 to 200, to, from, from 210 to 123. So I don't see that anywhere where there was adjustment of 123 residential lots. Um, and then when it comes to oil and gas, you know, I don't know if, if this commission, planning commission, read the article on Sunday's paper about the problems they had up north in Fort Lupton they had to deal with uh, underlying pipes, uh, spaghetti line, gathering lines that were not removed. And then they had to move it, remove it because um, there was a leak. And then the residential area that was received that gas, they had to go mitigate to take the whole house down, strip all of the, contents of the pipes to remove them and they had to go really deep almost like what you have to do in order to put in a new residential so even though these wells are abandoned and plugged and i saw someone that were removed i think 
if there's going to be anything moving forward on this, planning is very important. You guys have a, a, a hard job here, but I want you guys to think about that. I, I've been seeing a lot of things just kind of moving forward without really detailing it. I think this is more should be a study session and then come back with this so people can process this. To process 503 pages over the weekend, which I did, but that's a lot to process. And this right here should have been separate from itself from the other one. Um, again, I know it was stated earlier from my wife about the, the uh, no clustered homes because that is, that really ruined uh, Tower Road and, and then adjacent areas around Reunion with those cluster homes that Oakwood has. That's terrible design. Um, the charter school setting, I'm not, for, uh, not against charter schools, but 27J does not need charter schools because they are, at, they're, blast, they're, they're blasting at the walls for seats for, for kids. And we cannot build schools fast enough. And this school will not accommodate the future growth in that area because even though it's, it's a public private school, um, it's still limited. You have to apply. It's not automatic. Um, so I think this board, this planning board, needs to make sure that all pipes, existing pipes, are removed from this site. Yeah, you can plug in abandoned wells, but they need to go deeper. They need to open this whole area up. I'm talking about digging 100 feet, 200 feet down, removing dirt, because you might have contaminated soil there. And that's what happened up north. They ended up that that methane leak from those old pipes ruined the soil so they had to go in and remove all the soil and replace it with with um new with new dirt um and so and i know i know the, the the mill levy is not you know as far as how that's going to set up i think that's that's city council's deal but i i, I didn't really hear from mark nelly uh, you know he did explain about uh grandfathering in and I was a council for eight years we've been talking about oil and gas since 2012 and this site never came up to be grandfathered in so that that to me is not clear if that is true um and I understand about the setbacks but like I said to order to mitigate that all pipes had to be removed because I do not I did not like that article the Denver Post um uh, posted and you guys need to read that um and that's yes. what I yeah, we are at our time. That's fine. I just, I just want to have some clarification because I, I'm, I'm not, not happy about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dominic, I think just a few follow-up questions. I think you know, for you, the from the for the city purchase land, I think it was the 20 acres, right? I mean, just to confirm, you know, where that where that went from what I heard from you. So to clarify. The city purchased 210 lots, not 210 acres. Um, so those 210 lots were purchased all south of 88th Avenue. Um, the original PUD allowed for 1,129 residential units. Um, if you subtract 210 from that, it ends up being about 919 residential lots. And through some of the shifting of the filings, uh, the developer gained about four net lots through amendments to filing one, two, and three. So ultimately the residential count ended up being the same. Okay. And as far as the procedures for, you know, when a well is abandoned and plugged, is that, I'm assuming that's not followed in our local guidelines. That is, what, what, what are those guidelines and more is that given from? So ultimately what occurs, in, and this has to do with the number of rulemakings that have occurred at the COGCC, um, when there's a plug and abandonment that occurs on a well, they have to go through a Form 6 typically. And with these wells, there was um, separators and uh, tank batteries and storage of that kind. Um, typically with on the site, they'll remove the flow lines that go to those gathering lines and all of that. During the Anadarko pipeline removal, um, any adjacent necessary equipment was removed as part of that. Um, ultimately, that being in mind um, and trying to ensure that all of that has been in place um, at the time that the the operator goes in or ultimately if it's another entity that comes in and plugs it in those wells, um, to the extent possible, um, adjacent to those wells, um, the majority of flow lines and gathering lines should be removed. And there's a number of state regulations and federal regulations that apply to that. Okay. Okay. 
Do we also have a, a Ms. Sanchez, Alexa, or is that still she's not present with us today? She is not present. Okay. Anybody else that uh, that registered that I missed? No. Thank you. We will now close the the public comment portion of the meeting. For the case uh, there are no e comments received, so none to be. Uh, acknowledged now. Um, is there a motion for the case? I move that the Planning Commission enter a finding that subject to certain conditions requested PUD zone document for the property boundary by East 96th Avenue E-470, East 88th Avenue, and Tower Road contained in case Z-774-04-21 meet the criteria of the Land Development Code, and based upon such findings, recommend that the City Council approve the PUD zone document. Second. There is a motion, there is a second. Discussion from the commissioners? Great job, Dominic. This is not an easy thing to put together. Can we keep you forever? <laughs> I'll do my best. Don't let him retire. Is, uh, I, I agree, you know, Dennis, I think it's a great balance of maintaining our commercial presence um, and not letting go of that because I, I do think that is going to be a great gateway along, you know, Tower Road um, and along with the balance of the residential. So um, for that, I will be voting yes for for this i will say this is a heavy heavy lift um in a reorganization of the pud and i'm sure there have been multiple conversations i did hear the community concerns in regards to uh the oil and gas and potential grandfathering um you know i i think it is pertinent to uh say that the School District 27J, um, the city has no authority over how and when they use the lot, if that makes sense. So, I mean, that, that's, we, we have no authority over that. We're a, a planning board. So um, again, Dominic, uh, David Foster and crew, thank you for really keeping the development side and the commercial side of Commerce City at the forefront of what you're doing and uh, keeping up with the trends and uh, the way the development is happening uh, in that area. So for that reason, I will be voting for this. Well, Alexa, can you please call for a vote? Commissioner Yes. Yes. Commissioner Ingram? Yes. Commissioner Kamak? Yes. Vice Chairman Amador? Yes. And Chairman Popio? Yes. Thank you. The, mo the motion has passed. Five yeses, uh, zero noes. Again, thank you, Dominic. Thank you, staff. Uh, thank you to the applicant and the public for your comments tonight. Well appreciated. Um, that concludes our, our caseload for tonight. Um, We'll move on to any commission in business. Any anything from the from the commissioners? Cool. I will say that I did uh, receive my email that I was reappointed to the planning commission uh, for another couple of years. So thank you. That's great to hear, Mr. Amador. Woo. Wouldn't know to do it without you. Um, it sounds like we're going to get a couple of uh, alternates as well. So it'd be good to send out those names. Maybe Alexa or Steve, just so we can see who. I had a lot of people. I'm sorry. Go ahead, I, Mr. I had a lot of problems navigating and controlling the uh, PDF. Um, I don't know if it's that, you know, my computer's really slow or the file's so large, it takes. Um, so much memory, yeah, memory or CPU power. All I'm asking is that, <laughs> all I'm asking is that I, I don't know if we could get 
a, a PDF um, that's either condensed or in separate parts or, you know, maybe split up the cases or something like that. Um, so I'm not, uh, I'm not waiting for my computer to, tr you know, <laughs> turn the page. You know, I, I personally like the combined one. I didn't have any issues with the Mr. Yost. I know, Alexa, you've tried the file folder structure. So maybe you could post a combined packet and then one with maybe the drawing separated or something with it. Um, I can look into doing that. In that folder that you provided, the new structure shared folder? Mm-hmm. Thank that you. That might help you, Mr. Yost. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Alexa. Yeah, the problem is if they if they uh, put it all on a uh, regular size sheet of paper, the drawings oftentimes you can't see enough detail to make a make a decision. So you just have to increase your, you know, your screen uh, magnification or decrease it on the pages that you know don't fit into your screen. I'm not sure you're uh, using trying to use it off the internet too, Mr. Yes, if you use it off like a Bluebeam or no. Adobe, then that's that's be better for you. I tried to download it and it was slow downloading. So I just put it on the, you know, I just kept it on the internet. That seemed to work a little better. Uh, but as Commissioner Kamak said, there are times when you need to increase the size of the photograph or verbiage in the document. And um, with it on the internet, that's difficult to do. Yeah, sometimes saving as, and we can, maybe we can work with you after this. I mean, if you save as a document and open it with a PDF reader like a, a Bluebeam or Adobe, you know, something like that, that's that's a preferred option and probably would help you. Okay. Uh, if there's no further commission business, move on to attorney business. Uh, Mr. Swan, anything we need to discuss tonight? No attorney business this evening. Thanks. Thanks for uh, joining us tonight. Not a problem. Thanks for making my life easy. <laughs> um, any staff business, Steve? Anything we need to discuss? Um, just a, um, uh, I don't have the, the latest in terms of a March meeting yet, so stay tuned on that. We'll know here in a couple of weeks. Um, but we do have a couple of new people, new staff people to introduce. So um, uh, we have a couple of new planners, um, Harry Brennan and Omar Youssef. Um, both of them were on the line tonight, but you'll see them in the future. They're joining us um, from uh, in-state and out-of-state, and so um, so we welcome them. And then Trisha has a new administrative staff as well. Trisha? And Trisha's on mute, there you go. Yeah, yeah I Trisha. know. <laughs> uh, this is um, Kim Adami, she is our new admin too, so um, she will be the backup to Alexa, so you might start getting emails from her and communications coming from her as well. And Great. she lives here in Commerce City. Great. Welcome to the team. Mm -hmm. Great place to live. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thanks for the update. Anything else from any of the commissioners or staff? Not sure. Thank you for the meeting, and uh, our meeting is adjourned. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.